Do you want to talk real quick about Medicine 1.0, 2.0, 3.0? So Medicine 1.0 is the type of medicine that dominated for virtually all of human existence. So if we, you know, if we argue that humans have been around, you know, Homo sapiens have been around about 250,000 years from, from the arrival of our species until the latter part of the 19th century, um, we were practicing this thing called medicine 1.0, which truthfully wasn't medicine in the way that we think about it today. It wasn't scientific in the way that we understand science today. It was the best that humans could do missing this tool, right? Missing this tool of inference. And, you know, it relied on a belief about, you know, perhaps gods, spirits, humors, um, and so, you know, it, to be just blunt was largely ineffective. Um, and so, you know, the, the doctor of the past didn't have any tools in large part because they didn't have any understanding of what was going on in terms of disease processes. So not surprisingly, humans, uh, didn't live that long on average. Uh, and you know, the median life expectancy would have been into the late thirties or early forties. Um, the causes of death were typically related to communicable diseases, uh, infections and death associated, um, with child mortality and, um, maternal mortality. So just the process of having a baby was incredibly dangerous to both the mother and the baby. Um, and obviously that heavily skews lifespan data. If you're killing young mothers and babies in the process of having babies, you're really bringing down lifespan and life expectancy and couple that with infections, communicable diseases and trauma. Um, and you know, I think most people aren't surprised to know that, yep, that's pretty much how people died. Um, and then of course, after the, after, you know, the civil war and we, we move into the latter part of the 19th century, a couple of things start to come together. Now, the first of these actually happened in the 17th century, um, but it wouldn't become germane to medicine until 300 years later, um, or 200 years later, rather. And that was Francis Bacon codifying the scientific method. So again, this is something you know, we take for granted today, but this idea that you would make an observation, which is what science is all about. You observe something around you, you observe something in the natural world, you form a hypothesis about why it is happening. You design an experiment that is equipped to test the hypothesis. You conduct the experiment and measure the outcome, and you compare the results of the experiment to the prediction of the hypothesis. And that is effectively the framework for what science is. And so with that as the scaffolding upon which people could begin to make inference, you now layer on some other remarkable discoveries and insights. So a creation of the light microscope, the advent of germ theory, and ultimately the development of antimicrobial agents. All of these things collectively, I think I would add to that, just the practice of sanitation led to a remarkable change in the trajectory of human lifespan. Um, and of course, it's so remarkable that if you go from the late 1800s until, you know, fast forward just 100 years, which again is a sliver of time across a 250,000 year timeline, human lifespan approximately doubled. Um, so, you know, again, three, four, five generations to double human lifespan that had previously been unchanged for hundreds of generations is a remarkable feat. And we call this new system of medicine, medicine 2.0. Now there's lots of more nuance to get into medicine 2.0. Uh, medicine 2.0 ultimately developed even more remarkable statistical tools that allowed for things called randomized controlled experiments or RCTs, randomized controlled trials. And this really allowed medicine 2.0 to flourish and become supercharged. And um, Obviously, for the most part, medicine 1.0 was completely displaced by this. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't still some quacks out there that practice witchcraft, but 
for the most part, um, you know, when a person has an infection, when a person has congestive heart failure, when a person is in renal failure, when a person has appendicitis and needs to have their appendix removed, when a woman has a complicated pregnancy, all of these things now for people who are in the developed world are really easy things to manage using the toolkit of Medicine 2.0. So again, Medicine 2.0 was and remains an enormous success. And I certainly wouldn't be sitting here talking without Medicine 2.0. I would likely have been dead already, uh, as would you have. So why do we need to go any further? Why do we need a Medicine 3.0? Well, for all of the successes of Medicine 2.0, it has indeed had a couple of obvious and notable failures. Um, the most obvious is that lifespan has largely faltered. So there really has not been any extension of lifespan beyond that which came from the eradication of the conditions that led to the demise of most people uh, between the Civil War and the end of the First World War. Um, in particular, the types of diseases that kill people today uh, are very different types of diseases from those that killed people 150 years ago. So the leading causes of death, which I describe as the four horsemen of death, uh, are the diseases of atherosclerosis, so uh, coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease, cancer, the neurodegenerative diseases and dementing diseases, uh, so Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, all of those diseases. And then the slew of metabolic diseases that while directly not responsible for an enormous number of lives lost compared to the other categories, uh, indirectly contribute immensely by amplifying all of these. Now, there's a couple of other things I haven't mentioned there at the population level. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is also an enormous cause of death, um, but its cause is almost exclusively related to cigarette smoking. So I don't really hold Medicine 2.0 particularly responsible for the failure of mitigating that. That's really more of a public health question. Um, if people don't smoke, they don't get COPD, even though COPD is one of the leading causes of death. Um, there are, of course, accidental deaths, um, and we can spend some time talking about those later because there's an enormous spread of what those look like across lifespan and, of course, by geography. So, in essence, the purpose of Medicine 3.0 is to try to address where Medicine 2.0 has fallen short. It's not to replace Medicine 2.0. Um, I certainly, from time to time, um, hear feedback from people who I think misunderstand the arguments I've tried to lay out. And uh, there, there's nowhere that I'm suggesting that we need to do away with Medicine 2.0, that we don't want the system as it exists today in its capacity to do what it can do. What I argue is that we need to shift resources away from solely focusing on Medicine 2.0 to focusing on what we'll talk about in a minute, which is Medicine 3.0. So if we're putting 100 units of resources today into Medicine 2.0, I think most economists would argue that's still too many units of, of economic input. In other words, healthcare makes up far too big a section of the economy. So maybe instead of it being 100 units that go into healthcare, it really ought to be closer to 60 units that go into healthcare. And I would argue further, maybe 30 of those units should be aimed towards Medicine 3.0 and 30 of those units should be aimed towards Medicine 2.0. Because when it hits the fan and something goes really wrong, you know, again, trauma, infection, heart attack, by all means, you want Medicine 2.0 there to backstop those things. But Medicine 3.0's job is to make those encounters with Medicine 2.0 less frequent, less severe, and later in life. So that is effectively the difference. The, 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 the final point I'll make on that is kind of just briefly explaining what Medicine 3.0 is, which is, because at this point it's self-evident, it almost doesn't need to be explained, Medicine 3.0 really has two main hallmarks. Uh, the first is that it is aimed at 
preventing rather than treating chronic disease by acting early, acting aggressively, and tailoring the therapies to the individuals based on the best available evidence, which is not necessarily going to be derivable from randomized control trials. And the second pillar of Medicine 3.0 is that health span is to be given at least as much effort and attention as lifespan. This is again another enormous difference between Medicine 2.0 and Medicine 3.0. Medicine 2.0 does not place emphasis on health span. Its emphasis on health span is anywhere from zero to very small, depending on the subspecialty. So there are, there are certainly some physicians whose practices do take them a little bit into the arena of health span. But, um, you know, outside of, for example, physicians uh, or healthcare providers who work specifically in the arena of mental health, again, it's relatively low. Obviously, orthopedic surgery is a is a is a you know a discipline of medicine that is more squarely uh, featured in the health span arena. But for the most part, most of the healthcare dollars are spent on addressing uh, and trying to elongate lifespan. Uh, and I would argue that we need to be you know putting just as much effort into health span. So that's that's the fundamental difference between medicine 3.0, 2.0, and 1.0. Thank you.